What a wonderful episode that you're about to enjoy. There's no possible way that we recorded on Monday and that there was a band announcement from James White right after. Enjoy. Fresh and Buds now. Fresh and Buds. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of Fresh and Buds. I'm your host, Tommy Fresh, and you are all my buds, and we are joined once again by Kale from Dead Summer Art. It is the lore episode, folks. We have a ton of it this time. It's actually pretty exciting. You know, they are pumping out a lot of lore for Rosetta, so we are pretty stoked. We're happy to be talking about it. Kale, how's it going, my friend? How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Um, it's been a busy time over the past couple of months. Uh, you know, things not only with my own content, but with Flesh and Blood, been kicking into high gear. Rosetta has me the most pumped I've been for a set in oh quite some time. What was the last set I was really hyped on? Um, Dust Till Dawn was pretty hyped for me. And like, Part of the kind of was too, but I don't know, I think maybe monarch like this is this is oh, kind of wow. hitting like monarch crucible of war levels you know <laughs> okay so um <laughs> yeah really really interested to see how these new heroes play and and obviously the stories that we're getting now so yeah well yeah. i mean you're just showing everybody you're a huge uh flesh and blood boomer there uh <laughs> bringing out the crucible of war which is kind of crazy right like it didn't seem that far away for a long time and now it's so far away that those sets came oh, out it's- you know the, so old. the whole world has changed since then which is which is crazy but yeah it's going to be pretty excited i'm pretty hyped as well i'm very fortunate to be going to uh, i think as you are all listening to this i will be in tampa bay getting ready to do the world premiere hopefully open some cool stuff that we haven't even seen yet you know last week we had smith on we talked about like commons and rares we don't know what these majestics and legendaries are like which is pretty crazy to think about And I think an awesome thing. I know some people are like, ah, you know, I don't know. Uh, I I wish I knew. I think it's sick to be opening them up in real time. How do you feel about that? As someone that that won't, you know, obviously won't be able to be there, but you do get to share the experience of people posting it on Twitter and stuff. Yeah. um, One thing about Flesh and Blood that I've always really liked is that commons and rares, like, mean something. So, like, you know, Magic the Gathering, for example, which I used to play. Um, like people didn't really care about anything other than like rares and uh, mythics. You know that was kind of all everyone was really focused about. But like in Flesh and Blood, like a lot of your deck can oftentimes be run like the engine itself, or not so much the engine, but like kind of the chassis of your car of a deck uh, is comprised of like just really solid commons and rares. Like one of my all-time favorite cards, Morvian Skies, is a rare. Mm. And it's just, it, it does work for me. You know, I love everything it does. So like to, to really have the community focus on just commons and rares was quite refreshing. Um, and it also got, you know, people were less cynical about cards because when we had spoiler seasons where we were showing off Majestics in between commons and rares, if, if a common or rare popped up, most people just didn't really give it the time of day. Mm-hmm. Um, but now, because it's all we've got, we are like justifying the existence of <laughs> commons and rares. So, like every common and rare, we're really picking a puppy. Like, oh yeah, this could be good in this deck or this situation. Um, you know, it's not just oh, it's a common. It's only for limited. You know, so um, I don't know. It was a very unique spoiler season. So I, I actually thought it was quite refreshing the way that they sort of put out cards where it's just commons and rares. Yeah, it is interesting because you know. Obviously, the power level isn't crazy with these cards, but like you said, they they make up a lot of these decks. And I think something that people could miss sometimes, I do think that, yeah, while these cards will fill out the deck and kind of tell us what the deck does, they are going to be propped up by the Majestics, right? And, And the Legendaries. But we know what needs to be propped up now, which is really cool. And, you know, when I saw my spoiler card, which... Kale voiced Florian <laughs> in the Blossoming Decay 
spoiler video. Thank you very much, Kale. It was a wonderful yes, job. Well done. <laughs> and um, when I saw that, obviously, I, I was like, oh, I'm going to play it in Florian. And then I'm like, no, this is a Verdance card. And then I watched the Blitz deck uh, videos that, that LSS put out. And I was like, oh, this is a Verdance card. And I'm like, this plays really well in Verdance. So, mm. you know, it is, uh, it's really cool. All, the, all this stuff is really cool, and I'm excited to see the Majestics. Now, before we do get to the meat and potatoes of Rosetta and what's happening lore-wise, you've been putting out, you know, since we last chatted, you've been putting out some pretty consistent content in the form of shorts, but also you, you put out a lore starter guide, which is doing quite well. And, you know, I've shared even with my local game store, you know, for, for people looking to get more into lore, which is a great spot. You know, can you tell us a, a little bit more about this lore starter guide and, and what the goals are there? Yeah. So I had been for a long time now, anyone who's watched my channel, you would know that I am very inconsistent with the amount of videos I post, um, simply because a lot of them take a, like a lot of time to produce. So I, I wanted to not only like do shorts to kind of get out consistent content, but try and do some videos that were less intensive on like animation. Cause that's where like most of my uh, time get sunk into if I'm making a video it's just like animation so <clears throat> I was thinking you know all these people they never really know on like Facebook pages or like or Facebook groups or like discord servers that they're always asking where can I read the law you know people are linking them to different areas sometimes they link to my channel sometimes to um, legendarystories.net which is a great resource or like somewhere else and I was like what if I just compile it and make a video that just explains everything for a beginner. Here's how you can like submerge yourself into the law. Um, and I also knew it was going to be one of those videos that's like really, uh, I don't know what the phrase would be like, very uh, like evergreen or like very easy for people to just like see it in their recommendations and click on it. Because most of my other videos are very, like, very, very niche. Like, even within a niche sort of section of the Flesh and Blood community, that was still kind of niche. Mm -hmm. The way I'd title them, like, it would be, like, Heroes of, Vol uh, Heroes of uh, Wraith, the yeah. Emperor, was the video I did before. And if you see that in your, in your sidebar, you don't quite know what it is. So I was like, look, what if I just do something that had, like, a thumbnail that's kind of, like, clicky, like, not clickbait, but very very poppy out there, um, grab people's attention because my channel just grows very slowly. Um, so I was like, what if I just try and, you know, get a lot of engagement? So that's kind of how everything came together. And it, it went amazing. Like I checked, I think today, actually, it's got over 3000 views, which is one of my top videos on my channel of all time. Uh, it might be, I think it's third highest. I think the only other two that are higher than it are the episode I made about who is Fiendol, because mm -hmm. um, I made that ages ago, and that's a very like hot topic for people to know. And then the other one was like an overview of the world of Wraith and the regions. So, uh, yeah, got a ton of engagement, a ton of new subscribers. It helps people get into the lore, which is all I really care about. And uh, yeah, so so that was the the lore starter guide, and then. Obviously, outside of that, been making a bunch of shorts just to get some content out. I just wanted to get more things out. And I was like, a lot of the things I would want to talk about are just like too short to really put into a full video. So I was like, look, shorts, give it a whirl, see how it goes. And they've been doing great too. I think like most of them average about 500 views, which is more than a couple of the videos of my YouTube channel, to be honest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like the, uh, the video I did on the Emperor, which was like a little cinematic piece, that has less views than pretty much all of my shorts. And the shorts, I can, I can pump them out super fast. If I get the idea in my head, I can do it within an hour, and I've got a short. And yeah, it's just a good way to keep my channel sort of active and, and not having people question, where's the content? Is he still making it? Because <laughs> I've had that before, so... Yeah, it's been good. That's it's awesome. Really good. You know, the the shorts are are are, are 
it's crazy how the algorithm algorithm works for the shorts to be honest because like i've made some that i'm like oh this like won't get fed to anybody and then you make another one and then it's like oh this is like everybody's seeing this and you're like whoa what's yeah. going on here <laughs> and it is uh it is a really cool way to keep active for sure and you know in terms of the success of the lore starter guide i wouldn't even i mean you kind of hinted at the clickbaitiness of it but I, I i just look at that thumbnail and i'm like this is just a resource and i think people just love resources especially in this hobby mm-hmm. right people want something that they can gain knowledge from and i think that that is so important and uh yeah no i mean i think it's awesome and i think it's a great thing to kind of keep propping up and it's, it's kind of cool as 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 more lore stuff happens in the game or or, or more resources get available to you know, to the the general public, you know, I could see that kind of being a series like updated lore guide 2025 or whatever, you know, and that would be really cool to see. So, you know, as well as, you know, just we get you on the show and we get a little bit of dose of like, what, what should we know now, which should be really interesting. Now, we did just say goodbye, or technically saying goodbye. I think a lot of people said goodbye to MST a long time ago, <laughs> but we are technically in the sunset of MST. Interesting set, controversial at times, very powerful. You know, some of the great limited play uh, that we've seen in the game. What were your thoughts on on both the lore and the gameplay we received from this powerful set now that, you know, the dust has settled? Yeah, so um, I guess on like the actual set itself, like to play it. Um, so we ran a pre-release for my club, um, and that was really good fun. Uh, I ended up uh, with my sealed pool. I played Zen, which, unbeknownst to all of us at the time, ended up being very good. But <laughs> even just playing in the pre-release, I was like, "Damn, Zen's good!" Like Zen's got Zen's got hands, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I ended up 3 owing my my pre-release, so that was pretty fun. Um, I versed... Uh, what did I verse? I versed another Zen. I know I versed an Enigma in the finals. And maybe I versed New. Yeah, I did. So I versed every every single hero. The Gambit. And um, Yeah, the Gambit. <laughs> and yeah, just, just realizing, like, being able to tutor your deck for a card with combo... And get a crouching tiger. Damn, that's some good stuff. <laughs> yeah. It was impressive. I mean, like, you know, in limited, certainly not the crazy thing we saw. It certainly could be very powerful, especially in sealed if you get like the right reds for the deck. Um, you know, you're always guaranteed to have ha- however many uh, cheat cards that you want in sealed anyway. So, like, you know, you could build this like super powerful Zen deck. It, it, it kind of it didn't fall apart in in draft, but you definitely had to really read your seat. Now, when when you were on, we we hadn't gotten a ton of lore for MST, which is like a total one eighty for for this episode. You know, <laughs> what was there anything that after we recorded uh, in what was that May, maybe maybe April? Yeah, uh, I something think like about that. May, yeah. Was there anything after that that kind of you know, fulfilled maybe some of your wants and needs for the lore coming from Mysteria? Um, yeah, they released lore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of the main thing that happened, I guess. Um, like, I understand why now after hearing James White talk about issues that they had with writers, because it sounded like they had contracted writers to come in. Um, I forgot what their name their names were. It was like uh, Ed, I want to say like Edwin and Rachel. They might have been a couple um but um yeah they they ended up you know going off to do their own things so they were stuck without law um essentially after bright lights they had no law so that's probably why they were like hey we need a writer uh, <laughs> and they were putting out a call for a writer um but yeah they finally released some law and i was very happy with it it was written in kind of like a different style obviously because there were different writers um but it was just really refreshing. I don't know how to describe it. Maybe it's because we had such a drought of lore that I was just like, you know, a single raindrop and I'm like in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 
yeah, it was it was very cool. Um, for those that don't know, essentially the the story was um, Zen noticed that there was some sort of disturbance with with Chi within Mysteria, and uh, he ends up going into uh, the Miss Cloak uh, Tea House, which is run by Nu. And uh, at the same time, Enigma is kind of you know traversing Mysteria, and she kind of senses the same thing. So it ends up being this big clash of all three heroes together, and we get like some some cool showcases of what news abilities are she can actually shape shift into a snake which is like crazy um well, kind of not surprising but yeah. <laughs> um very cool um and enigma uh we found out her uh, original name from one of her past lives because enigma and new actually knew each other um and yeah there was just like a really nice kind of assembly of of these heroes like coming together and it, the story made sense you know it didn't seem like it was forced it wasn't like one hero was there just because they were a part of the set and they needed a way to put them into the story it it all kind of felt very cohesive so um yeah it was pretty good like i'd, I'd probably rate it like maybe an eight out of ten in terms of the law that we've received so far so um yeah part of the miss vale law delayed but when it came out it was good. I just wish we could have had it maybe leading up to the set. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, so, but, it, it yeah. is an exciting way to, to get people hyped for the set. So, obviously, <laughs> this is all being fixed now. But that is that is pretty cool. It's funny, like, Zen f- senses a disturbance and then becomes the disturbance <laughs> yeah. gameplay-wise, which is, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, we can... We could talk about that every episode of the podcast ever. <laughs> it is, it is a old news at this point. But now let's talk about some cards from MST. Your fresh faves, mm-hmm. you know, we got to get your fresh faves of whatever the most recent set was, and it is MST. Who was your favorite hero from Part the Misfill? I would say it would have to be New. Uh, just because I really like Assassin, I thought Enigma might have taken the cake, but I don't know. There was something about New. I think it was more so just they w- the way that they presented Assassin as something like non stereotypical. I really love like one way to to draw me into any sort of like fictional story is to break the stereotypical like trends that you get in the stories. You know. So to have essentially like an assassin that's not cloak and dagger hiding in alleyways, they mm-hmm. are out in the open luring you to them, uh, you know, picking apart their memories before they know it, you know, they've been lulled in to, you know, a false sense of security. And then by that time they're, they're being eaten, uh, literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just thought it was really cool. Um, I thought maybe out of all the characters, Zen was kind of like, the least interesting to me not that he wasn't interesting but he's a very stereotypical kind of like monk ninja so i was like okay that's kind of you know same same and, and enigma had some some kind of flair to her which was interesting i love anything that's related to like the moon and the stars so um you know and i really liked her backstory but yeah new just had to take the cake she was just so different and out there especially to play too it's like such an interesting way to play like play your opponent's cards oh yeah yeah so. i mean it's, <laughs> it is i mean interesting is a way to uh, say that it can be uh so annoying but that's all right you know it's kind of interesting though you, you kind of mentioned the zen is very stereotypical i was hoping for like gameplay wise relating to what zen is i was hoping for the like the true defensive ninja, right? To me, th- that was what I was expecting, kind of. And I guess in a way, like you get like this huge, <laughs> you get this huge offensive burst by being defensive uh, via Traverse and, and even uh, the Kakara, uh, or no, the Kasaya, sorry. And, you know, I understand that that happens, but, like, I was hoping for, like, D-Reacts. Like, I, I love Territorial Domain. Like, that card, like, seemed so cool. Like, this is what, in my head, Zen should have been. Like, this, like, create a crouching tiger and then, you know, get this really sweet defensive bonus and then I'll attack with my, you know, my Kakara plus a, a, a you know, I, I was hoping for that, you know, this, like, new Kadachi 
like turtle Kadachi kind of thing. Not Kadachis, but like with Crouching Tigers. So I felt like they missed the mark in terms of the lore to Hero, but the other two were just, I felt like, home runs, you know? So mm, now speaking sure. of weapons, we only had three, right? Uh, which one was your favorite? <laughs> uh, I, would, I would just say Cosmo, just because, I mean, lore-wise, it's a sentient scroll. Which is really cool, and it's a scroll. We've we've never had a scroll before. I just love the idea of you know someone walking around with this big ass scroll on their back, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it's just the interaction with like ward cards and the fact that you could use it in any illusionist is is really nice too. Because both uh, actually, I know the Karkar could be used in like any ninja, but yeah, it, it's so. very restrictive as to like the game plan that you want to play with it. Because if you're not doing any crashing tiger stuff at all, like it's mm-hmm pretty much useless um and like beckoning i will say beckoning misblade i've misread that card so often (laughs) i used to just think it said your next if this hits your next blue attack gets plus one i didn't realize it gave it go again (laughs) (laughs) which after i had that happen the first time i was like oh oh no like this is this is horrible (laughs) um but yeah I'd, i'd probably say cosmo i don't know if you'll take it as well i've forgotten the name of it there is a upcoming judge promo uh, oh. that is an adjudicator weapon, and it's like a paintbrush. I really like that one, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I we won't count that. it for this. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't even remember what it's called. I'm sure Gary is screaming right now, it's this, you know, but um, yeah, no, good, good answer. I mean, Cosmo is the coolest of all of them, and every time I look at Cosmo, I think of the magic carpet from Aladdin for whatever reason it just has that same kind of movement in the i I could show you the world (laughs) (laughs) i'll attack you with go again on my on my plus one counter or uh it becomes very annoying anyway um that's the song folks equipment (laughs) what was your favorite equipment from the set uh i kind of had two um mask of recurring nightmares kind of got to be the obvious answer Mm -hmm. um the amount of times i've versed a new and then I'm like, oh, I think they're going to play like just a Nick or something. So I'm like, oh, maybe I should block out. So I go to block out and I'm like, oh, I have this one card from the next turn. And it's gone. <laughs> they've, they've banished it out of my hand. I was like, oh, I forgot that card even existed on the battlefield. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's, that's kind of the obvious answer. Plus the artwork is sick. Um, is why he always knocks it out of the park. He's, he's probably my favorite fab artist, is why he at this point. Um, but the second I'd probably say is Stonewall Gauntlet. Oh, yeah. Um, because, like, that can really, like, as a sideboard option, that just seems so sweet. Like, against certain decks, it just completely ruins some of their turns. Um, which I think it's, it's used against Zen, mm-hmm. right? I'm not too up to date with the meta, but, like, that seems like such an anti Zen card. So it seems like they were, they were definitely expecting Zen to be good, but not as good as he is. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the gauntlets, even in certain, like, if, if it can block two, essentially, on, like, mm. a non-long combat chain. So, like, it could be a decent option for almost any deck. I mean, sure, we're getting a lot of class cards that are probably better in that slot, but still a totally fine option. And what was your favorite run-of-the-mill card, cards you throw in your deck? Uh, Well, <clears throat> as a Runeblade player, it's, it's got to be obvious. Uh, it is a bit of a cop-out answer because it's an expansion slot card, but I'm Eloquent sorry. Eulogy. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's just exactly what Vincent needed. Just one card hand where you can attack for like five, probably get a uh, Eloquence token. That That's pretty good. Um, but if I were to choose like something actually in the set proper, Rowdy Locals. There's, oh, yeah. there's something about Rowdy Locals. I know you're on that train too. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's just like... A zero blue block three. It only attacks for two, but if it gets blocked by pretty much anything outside of like equipment and a reaction, like it's got to get buffed. Mm-hmm. And then if it, it has a relevant on hit with disruption, like sure, you've got to discard a card too, but like, I mean, in Florian and Verdance, you want to be putting cards in your graveyard. I don't know. You know, <laughs> maybe I'll have to do some experimenting. It so. is. I mean, that card is so sweet. I lost to it on stream. <laughs> Which, like, I couldn't even be mad. I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> that card really good. And it is it is so cool. And I just love the... 
I I so badly want the Phi deck where you know you attack with it. Well, nothing's happening. I'm just attacking with this. You can block it, whatever. And then you just you know it was like zero cards in hand. And then you're just like, oh, Phoenix Flame back to hand, discard it, boom, boom. And we're just uh, getting a little crazy. But yeah, that card's awesome. Now, Kale, new question, courtesy of Junior. What class and talent would you be if you lived in the world of Wraith? So I've had a lot of time to think about this question because I've been... Obviously, I listen to the show every week, but um, I would like to say I'd be a Runeblade, obviously, but I don't quite think I've got the physical strength there. Um, So I would actually say either Abducator or alchemist if that comes out (laughs) um maybe if there's a scholar class as for talent i reckon elemental actually um i was thinking about all the talents like i'm not really into the whole holy stuff Mm -hmm. i I am kind of more on the like you know grungier kind of shadow side but that's that's not really who i am as a person per se so i was like you know elements is kind of like that sweet spot um i like nature i like kind of the idea of like upholding balance i really like the idea of like balance just in life um so i think like an elemental educator is kind of like someone who could be the 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 hero that kind of balances all the elements with one another you know that really fits into the educator theme um so yeah that they're probably my answer maybe merchant as well that could be fun but i'm i'm probably pretty bad at (laughs) haggling (laughs) every time i'm trying to like haggle someone on like buying a car it, it i'm just always a pushover so maybe not merchant but educator elemental elemental educator that's that's probably my my hero bringing balance to all the elements just like they wanted starvo to do but you do it right <laughs> i think it, yep. <laughs> that would my, be... no 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 you're 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 fusing too many times you can only do it once yes yes yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh no very good answer now speaking of elemental heroes Mm -hmm. and the elements in general we are back in aria folks tales i do think was certainly one of the more flavorful sets we've ever had right tales of aria it brought a lot of people to the game it it introduced elements um ice lightning earth in in different ways it was it was kind of interesting we didn't have strictly ice heroes we didn't have strictly earth heroes we didn't have strictly lightning heroes we had the combination of the two and i think in a way tales felt a little homogenous in a way because there was so much mix and and match with the elements and and the fuse stuff was certainly uh, a cool mechanic but maybe a little bit too much for what they want in the game going forward so we're seeing rosetta now and it is very hype but we're only getting earth and lightning this time and we have a listener question later about the third element so we'll we'll save that for now so what has changed in aria this region where you know everything seems to be actually pretty cool like we saw everfest here um and stuff like (laughs) that what's what's changed since tales of aria and and what we're seeing now with rosetta the main things that are changing is just kind of the the ongoing disturbance, I guess, all across Wraith. Um, so we know that the barrier between Arya and the rest of Wraith has kind of uh, waned, and um, you know, Arya is becoming exposed to the wider sections of Wraith, um, and and we're starting to see the sort of ripple effects of the War of the Monarchs, especially. Um, we'll we'll get into that when we talk about heroes like Aurora and Asilio specifically. But that also does play into the main story of Rosetta, which is the death of the Queen of Candlehold, which is very significant. Um, <clears throat> so I guess to give a bit of a backstory, so a section of Arya is called Candlehold. <clears throat> and during the Third Age, when the forces of uh, the Old Ones were attacking Wraith, the Queen of Candlehold... Um, was fighting alongside the Ancient of Earth and Lightning, Devnir. And as Devnir fell in sort of a final attempt to stop the Old Ones, she used the essence of Devnir to create a storm of energy, which 
annihilated all the old ones, but also kind of annihilated her own people too. <clears throat> and these people, their souls became infused with something called the Strail. So throughout all of Arya, there's something called the Flow, which is like this elemental energy. The Strail is a very chaotic, uh, volatile version of the Flow. So all of her people became kind of one with the Strail. Um, and the Queen gathered all of the souls of the people, of her people, put them into seeds and scattered them across Candlehold before she fell into a slumber. Mm -hmm. um, as part of her falling into the slumber, she kind of became fused with her throne and became kind of permanently tied to Candlehold. Um, all the seeds, when they eventually sprouted and bloomed, uh, they grew into the Rosetta. Uh, so the most well-known Rosetta that we know of up until this point is Briar. So Briar's seed was scattered into the Briars, literally, of Candlehold, the very volatile, dangerous areas of Candlehold. So that gave her special powers. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of the, I guess, the origin of like Candlehold. Um, and in the current Rosetta story, essentially what's happening is the Queen has just started to die. And that's caused a lot of conflict between uh, particularly two heroes, Florian and Verdance. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you want to dive into that right now, but uh, we definitely can. Well, I just want to, you know, what you're describing, is this what we're seeing in the card Felling of the Crown, right? You know, we see yeah. these... Uh, I don't know if they're <clears throat> some kind of cultists or, or priests kind of bowing <laughs> at this kind of awfully creepy uh, dying mm. queen, I'm, I'm assuming, um, in this tree. And a lot of talks of, you know, uh, in, in the card itself, there is a quote here, with her fall, the ancient enchantment begins to fade and the rotwood stirs once more. So there's this enchantment that is protecting uh, this area and rotwood is this kind of, decay like almost like shadows creeping into uh this world mm. what what is the rotwood so from what we know of the rotwood it's a section of candlehold where things go to die um i believe this has been a place since before florian was born um and as with nature in itself things grow but things also die and this is kind of just the area where things die. Um, so Candlehold has been in what they call like a summer. Uh, I think they had been calling it an eternal summer. Um, and at this point with the queen actually dying, one thing about Candlehold is the Rosetta could not really leave Candlehold because Candlehold, since the queen had uh, unleashed that big storm and, and fused with her throne, it had kind of been cut off from the rest of Arya. Mm -hmm. um, only certain people were able to leave, one of which being Briar, um, simply just because she grew kind of outside the influence of this kind of uh, energy that was keeping the rest of the Rosetta like tied to Candlehold. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, that's basically what the Rotwood is. Um, and yeah, Felling of the Crown is definitely the depiction of the Queen in the stage of decay. Um, yeah, so the, the rotwood stirring again just simply means that decay is, is once again cycling through and getting ready for the next step in life, which is rebirth and, and renewal. So, Yeah, and you kind of mentioned Verdance and Florian here, obviously both representing two different sides of that coin, the, the decay mm. and then the, the rebirth. And it's very cool in these Earth cards we've seen that we see a little bit of both, right? And they both decompose... One using it as fuel for this decay and the other using it as, well, this is actually going to help rebirth uh, things as well. What, what's going on with Verdance and Florian here in relation to this story? So Verdance is a Rosetta that uh, is the uh, chosen rose of the queen. So... We don't 100% know exactly what that means, but I would assume it just means that it's the Queen's, like, right-hand man type of thing. Um, and Verdance has begun to 
be aware of the fact that the Rotwood is once again stirring. Um, and one of the Rosetta that is in the Rotwood is Florian. So from what we know of Florian, when the seeds of all the Rosetta were scattered across Candlehold, his landed in the Rotwood. Um, so he has always been an outcast to the rest of the Rosetta, um, especially with all of them being very used to this eternal summer where things are just lively and happy. Florian has been the, the contrast to that. So he's always been treated kind of a bit unfairly, despite the fact that his role is just as important as Verdance's. Um, and the two do have confrontations with one another. And Verdance goes to relay this information to the Queen of Candlehold, but at this time when she does, the Queen s suddenly dies, basically, <laughs> right in front of her eyes. Um, you know, maybe the news just shocked her too much, I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but now... Verdance is not only worried about the Rotwood, but the fact that the Queen's died and what this could mean for their eternal summer. And she's worried that, in her eyes, rot and decay is a bad thing. It's tainting life, you know? Um, but Florian argues that it's necessary and it might hurt, but in the end it will make things better. Being in eternal summer just means that the Rosetta have been stagnant for a very long time. Throughout the story, it actually does a very good job at depicting the other Rosetta as very, like, apathetic mm -hmm. towards any of Verdance's pleas. It's as if they are ready to actually pass on and, and decay and be reborn as, as new people. Um, so there is, like, a little bit of a fight that they have uh, with one another where um, they do inflict a little bit of damage uh, to one another. And Florian does actually kind of cut Verdance at one point um, and becomes very shy and, like, sheepish and, and regretful of the fact that he did that. So he kind of retreats back into the Rotwood. Um, so you can tell that he's, he's definitely not a bad guy. He's mm -hmm. just being perceived as a bad guy. He's just very misunderstood, hence the whole kind of, like, emo look yeah. that he has. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and it's very cool to see this sort of conflict where both sides are kind of right, but they just don't quite understand each other. And if they could come together to understand each other, that's when, you know, things can progress for the better. Um, and then eventually, after all this, um, th this is kind of part of the new stories that I was a little bit iffy on, just because it kind of, the conflict between Verdance and Florian was kind of resolved very quickly and a little bit off screen as well. Mm -hmm. um, but they do come to this like mutual agreement because when the queen of Candlehold died, she left behind a seed, um, which is called the seed of tomorrow. And basically there was a lot of discussion as to what should be done with the seed. Um, Verdance wanted desperately, obviously, to, to try and, you know, regenerate the Queen to continue the Eternal Summer, but a lot of the Rosetta were kind of starting to side with Florian, saying, you know, we need to let certain things decay. Um, but they come to a resolution. They end up planting the seed outside of Candlehold because they are now able to leave Candlehold. And I don't know if I got my interpretation of what was written in the story wrong, but I believe that the seed of tomorrow is now growing into a brand new millennium tree. Mm. So obviously most people would be familiar with the card channel, the millennium tree. And I actually made a law short on this. Um, there's some hidden law behind it that I found. Uh, so the artist, I'm probably going to butcher his name, Miliavoy Cheren, mm -hmm. I believe is how you pronounce it. Uh, his art direction He's been posting for some of the pieces of artwork that he's done for Rosetta. And it actually talks about the Millennium Tree and how it was like a nexus of power within Arya, kind of similar to Caution. Um, and it ended up being destroyed, I believe, during the Third Age. And the remnants of it became Rosetta Keep, which is like the main sort of fortress where the Rosetta reside, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which was really cool. So this idea that the queen has kind of died and is growing into like a new millennium tree, like a new kind of symbol of power within 
uh, sort of the Rosetta Order is just very cool. So that's kind of the gist of of the story that we've gotten with Florian and Verdance. They're they're kind of on good terms now, and they've kind of come to an understanding that you know both sides that they represented are just parts of a cycle. You know, it's a it's a wheel. You know, life, death, life, death. So yeah, it's kind of interesting because Verdance seems to represent <laughs> the the idea of like things are great. We think they should always be great. You know. Uh, this is how it should always be and really resistant to change and, and maybe even like not understanding what progress is. Right. And then Florian comes in and it's like, no, actually what, what you have is great, but it can be better, which is kind of such a really interesting conflict to have because Aria is this place where it's not, it's not war. Right. You know, mm. and to actually have like, ideals being the conflict here is is really interesting to me now i'm interested to hear about lightning in a second but also mm. you mentioning rosetta keep sounds like a perfect place to have a fable landmark i mean <laughs> if there's anything um <laughs> we will see maybe yeah. next week but you know it is it is very very neat i kind of love the i mean i you know as a big autumn fan and here in the states <laughs> it is september and that means autumn is upon us soon hopefully i mean then again it gets warmer Mm. every year but that's a different discussion for other people but um it is it's exciting and i love florian's vibe and and the fact that you know through a lot of these cards like blossoming decay and then also um cadaverous tilling you kind of get this this balance of the both and i think you know arguably you can you can say this is a representation of of their coming to terms with each other right yeah for sure like i guess one thing to kind of cap off that sort of talk is aria itself is anything but stagnant the landscape Mm. itself literally changes because of the flow you know one day something's a mountain the next it's a valley and for candle hold to be the way it was it was the complete opposite of the way aria was it was stagnant people didn't leave things didn't change so the fact that Candlehold is now changing, it's becoming one with Arya again and making Arya as a whole stronger, which with the old ones coming, that's a good thing. So, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. you know, I think there's a lot of, uh, I guess, hints here as to Florian being, being about the rebirth as well, not just the decay. I mean, if you look at, Florian specialization germinate right beautiful card first of all mm-hmm. but like germinate is to create new life and all this different stuff like it's definitely hinting at his end goal and like you know goes back to your point of being totally misunderstood but you know and I think it's good that Virgins comes around on it right you can't I mean you have to let it happen and I think that yeah. it's probably for the best for like arguably a stronger you know, candle hold or, or, or Rosetta in general. So it is, uh, it's pretty neat. Now lightning heroes. So this one's, this one's a little bit out of my depth because I've been paying more attention to these earth heroes. Asilio is a, is a, a puzzle, right? Gameplay wise. <laughs> and what the heck Asilio is. Can you tell us what's going on with these lightning heroes? Sure. So I would say, with Rosetta as a set, there's really kind of two storylines that are happening. The The main one that everyone focuses on, obviously, is Candlehold and the things going on with Earth. But the second story is one that I think is more important in the grand scheme of, like, the overarching story. Um, whereas the kind of Candlehold stuff was more, like, um, you know, self-contained. So <clears throat> these lightning heroes, Aurora and Asilio... I guess to start off, I'd have to describe a little bit of the region that they come from. So, obviously, we we all know Vault Haven, which is the location that Lexi comes from. Um, It's actually... Vault Haven is actually a part of a much bigger section of uh, Aria called Enion. Mm -hmm. And back during the... So, this is north of uh, Channel Lake Frigid, 
Oh, why did I say Channel Lake Frigid? Lake Frigid. I'm thinking about the car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's north of Lake Frigid. So it's it's to the north where things are a lot colder. Um, Anyon during the Third Age was a battlefield where Yavor, the Ancient of Ice and Thunder, fought against a lot of old ones. And when he died, he kind of scattered a lot of his essence and it caused a lot of the broken ground of Enion to actually rise up into the sky and begin floating. So that's actually how we have the floating isles of Enion and the floating village of Volthaven. Um, <clears throat> along with sort of this scattering of his essence, uh, Yavor left behind pieces of his weapons. And these weapons became sealed in vaults. And that is actually the main sort of uh, thing that Aurora is, is going after. So Lexi was a bit the same, being a wayfarer. Uh, wayfarers being individuals that travel Aria and kind of map the flow um, and discover new things. Lexi did go into a, um, into a vault herself. I believe that one was called Yavor's Peak. Uh, don't quote me on that. They've got weird names. <laughs> um, but Aurora's goal, from what we understand, was she had learnt of the existence of these vaults and sort of the myths and legends behind them. And her mission is to open every single vault. So she goes to a vault. I'm actually going to see if I can find the name of it um, because it was in some lore. Uh, Aurora basically, as, as part of the stories that we got for Rosetta, she travels to this vault um, and there is like a bunch of things in her way stopping her. So she manages to, with the, with the disturbances happening in Wraith, that causes a very large lightning storm within Enion. And Aurora uses this as her opportunity to get into a vault by channeling some of that lightning into one of its, uh, like this vault's massive door. And that causes it to open. So she waltzes in, she fights like a golem, there's a bunch of like puzzles. And eventually when she gets to the end, she finds this strange construct made of pure aether and like bits of metal with inscriptions called Asilio. So Asilio is essentially one of Yavor's uh, weapons that he had. And um, his existence kind of came to be when uh, this group called uh, the... Yeah, Ocilio was created by the Aether Scribes of the past to protect the future. So if you actually look in the young artwork for Ocilio, we had seen people kind of in the... at the bottom. They're probably Aether Scribes. We don't really know much about them. They might be related to the Seers that we had heard about before. Not quite sure, but they essentially cultivated one of Yavor's weapons into this entity, Asilio, um, to only rise once Wraith was threatened again by the Old Ones. Mm -hmm. And now that Aurora has opened this vault and Asilio is awake, it means that the Old Ones are coming to Wraith, which we've already seen, obviously, with the War of the Monarchs. Yeah. So um, I, I do know there is a question in here where you talked about... Um, the timeline. How damn... It yeah, the timeline. Diem Amada said that he thought this might have taken place before Monarch. And there's definitely, like, credence to that idea. Um, I'm not actually certain where I would place the timeline of the Rosetta stories compared to Monarch. It would definitely have to go Tales, then Rosetta. Mm -hmm. um, but as to where, like, that sort of block of Aria sets comes, is it's kind of hard to determine. But... Um, it's all kind of happening at once, you know? We're, we're getting all these different regions and sets where they're feeling the effects of the War of the Monarchs, and, and this is just part of it. So that's essentially, in a nutshell, what uh, Aurora has done, and then Ocilio is kind of wanting to, like, find out exactly what's happening. Uh, he's woken up to a version of Arya that's very different to the one that he fell asleep in. Mm -hmm. um, so he's kind of coming to terms with you know, not only Arya, but also this peppy young Aurora that's just waltzed into his vault and, and has just kind of awakened him. So, um, yeah, very interesting. There's, I think there's a lot more lore that we 
probably need to be made privy to, to to know exactly what's going on with these, but their story is definitely connected a lot more with the War of the Monarchs. So, Yeah, it is interesting. You know, they're... Like, I like that the two Earth heroes kind of are having their thing, and then the two Lightning heroes are having their thing, right? Like, it hmm. is... It is telling two different stories within one set, and it's like uh, I don't know if this is a this is. Let me know if this is crazy and out of line, but is sure. Basilio and Aurora's story not unlike Up, the movie, the Pixar movie, like the grumpy old sentient lightning being uh, is 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 now forced to you know maybe be softened by the young peppy Aurora here. Uh, to kind of come to terms with this world. Is this crazy? Yeah. No, I, I actually think that's a really good analogy, and it makes a lot of sense because a lot of people, there's been a little bit of discourse as to, like, the artwork for Aurora's, like, hero card. Some people said it was, like, too too much, like, Disney character, which kind of makes sense because, you know, Disney and Pixar, et cetera, up, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and and Asilio, you know... Like an up, did I? It's been a while since I've seen up. I believe the old man didn't want to move his house or like leave his house because it was going to be like developed over. Was that mm-hmm. was that part of the story? I think so. So yeah. he like flies away with it with all the balloons. Um, I mean that kind of makes sense with Asilio. You know, he's he doesn't want to necessarily change because if he has to wake up, that means something bad is happening in Wraith. So, um, you know, it's just got to <laughs> figure out who the dog is now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Maybe a meep. Instead yeah, of the dog. I, there's a lot of leaps <laughs> in this art. I, I swear to God. Yeah. Um, now, one final question that I really have in terms of the cards that we've seen and the lore that is related to it is sigils are a big theme in this mm. set, right? Can Do you know what these sigils are What like, and why do they seem to be so important in this set? I mean, they're obviously more important to Osilio, but... We see sigils in in uh, every class and every talent for the set. All right, so these sigils, um, I think they really tie in well with Asilio. Um, so I'll point to some older lore that we got. So back during Tales of Aria, there was a story that came out called A Grand Adventure, where Lexi actually goes into one of these vaults. Um, it was Yavor's Peak, I believe, was what it was called, and <clears throat> Throughout the vault, there's a ton of different like symbols um, that we know now are dialect. It's part of a dialect of the seers, and we don't really know who the seers are. I believe that they're tied into Enion and Vault Haven because Eisenloft has your Olin, um, Candlehold has your Rosetta. So it seems like anytime the the seers were talked about uh, alongside the others, it seemed like that was kind of Vault Haven thing. Um, so obviously with Asilio being from one of these vaults, ties to the Aether Scribes, um, it makes a lot of sense that he has like this connection with, with sigils and just, I guess, ancient symbols in general. Mm-hmm. I mean, even Volza, his weapon, I believe is covered in different symbols and whatnot. And if you look at a lot of the sigil cards, obviously it, it's a bunch of like, you know, runic kind of text, really. Um, I've got to go back and have a look at all of the cards um, especially the wizard cards, because there's a lot of symbols in there that might be more of the Seer's language, which we haven't fully sort of decoded yet. But um, yeah, I think I think it's really cool. I like sigils as like a gameplay piece as well. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's really cool the idea of like them giving you a benefit only when they leave, and then trying to like either bounce them to your hand or destroy them. It's just really cool. So yeah, I, th- I think sigils make a lot of sense, especially with Asilia. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, yeah, it makes sense. It's like this is the only thing Asilia knew and the only thing mm. that's kind of like <clears throat> makes sense in this new world that he's woken up to. So it's it's very very interesting. I'm I'm excited to see, you know, gameplay how it works out and then also just like we're going to see probably more high rarity sigils. We saw Asilia's specialization, which is a, uh, you mm. know, instant aura. <clears throat> and I'm excited to see what that means for what the hero does and 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 like why does Asilio care so much about it uh you know it makes sense that it's what he knows but you know will there be another piece that we see in some like higher rarity stuff so that should be really interesting now 
I think, you know, I mean, we could probably talk about Arya for hours and hours and hours, <laughs> but I think we, we are pretty set up for just like a real banger of a just flavorful set, right? A lot mm. like Tales of Arya. And, you know, what, what are your, like, you know, before we get to some listener questions, are you hyped? Like, I, I know you mentioned you're hyped, but like, oh, yeah. Does, does, like, what about this set is really, you know, making you excited? I think it goes back to what you mentioned earlier when we were talking a, a little bit about Tales of Aria was the fact that everything kind of felt very homogenized, like everything kind of melded together. There was a lot of shared identity between all of the heroes. Mm-hmm. And with this set, they're really focusing in on like what makes Earth Earth, what makes lightning lightning, um, which is really cool because, you know, we obviously got the melding of that in Tales, but it meant that each individual part kind of lost a bit of its character. Um, so, yeah, obviously, you know, with with all that, and then obviously Florian, everyone online probably knows how much I love Florian. Um, <laughs> actually, I've, I've got it behind me right now. I was watching on, on YouTube. This big old hunk of foam. Oh, <laughs> boy. Is, uh, is uh, a chess piece I'm working on for Florian. Oh, I um, can't wait. And And, you know, obviously in the Discord when you posted a notice that listener questions for <laughs> my episode were coming up you posted that uh, comparison picture i yeah. had between young florian and myself um so you know very very uncanny similarities um oh, yeah. you know he he he's all about autumn and part of the reason behind the name dead summer is autumn is my favorite season and what happens when summer dies? It becomes autumn. So uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's almost as if they made it for me specifically. But you know, I think it's just a coincidence. But maybe, no, maybe. I Listen, I don't want to you know, <laughs> jump to conclusions. But um, also, I want to say um, shout out to our bud Dagan White, who went to Dagan's skirmish in full, like not full. Uh, Florian Guard, but had the cape, which oh, know, I gotta yeah, see this. I haven't yeah, seen this yet. Check, check it out on Twitter because I saw it the other day uh, at Kadachi One. Um, the beautiful, you know, Florian cape. So and also a black rose, uh, very very on theme <clears throat> on brand. So I'm I'm excited oh, to see. All, I see it now. Yeah, yeah. It's gonna yeah, be, that's awesome. <laughs> it's gonna be exciting to see all the. I mean, all, the cosplay is gonna be pretty insane uh, from the set as well. So yeah, super I've, excited. I've, I've been talking to a few people in the community. Um, Essa, I, I, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce your name. Um, who's part of the Shapeshifters of Wraith, um, and uh, Jackie from Fab Workshop. I've been I've been talking to to both of them a little bit about things they're doing for their cosplays for Florian. So we're all gonna trade tips. Oh. And uh, yeah, this is my first proper foray into like real cosplay where I'm making like every part of it. So yeah, it's going to take a while, <laughs> yeah, but it's going to be fun. So almost as long as my Levi cosplay. I swear it's yeah, coming. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, it's coming. It's coming. I swear. I swear. It's not going to be good. It's not going to be good. Uh, we do have listener questions, though, to move on from that topic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can submit these listener questions on the Buzz Discord. I ping everybody before the guest comes on. First question comes from William from the Table Pit. What is Oldham's drink of choice? Is it pint of strong and stout? It's mug root beer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it has to be, right? He, he just looks like a mug root beer enjoyer, and, and I love that, you know? <laughs> he, he, he just might be. I, I would have thought, you know, like Jägermeister from the, from like the freezer, you know? Like, you know, how people leave some Jägermeister yeah, in the yeah. freezer. Ooh. Maybe he's got some sort of like weird drink where they have to like freeze it with dry ice first, or maybe it's like one of those super chill drinks where you bang it and it starts freezing in front of you. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, hold him, hold him, hold him. We'll get it, get to hold him in a second. Popo Mike asks, "What hero or which hero is in the greatest need of additional lore right now?" So, there's obviously a lot of heroes with no lore. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to ignore those because a lot of them are just Blitz heroes. And I'm sure at some point they'll probably get more lore. But in terms of like properly established heroes, the one that's really in need of the most lore, and you'll love me for this, I'm going to say Reinar. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Reinhardt's got nothing uh, since Welcome to Wraith. Um, you know, the story for Welcome to Wraith was just kind of his origin, waking up as a, you know, a new pup with <laughs> no parents and simply having to do whatever he could to survive. And then after establishing, like, his dominance within the Savage Lands, a bunch of no-good Solanian knights start prodding him, and, and he goes, you know, um, Alpha Rampage, and, yeah. <laughs> and tears him limb from limb, pun intended. You, um, <laughs> you know, unleashing the beast within. Um, <laughs> and then after that, for some reason, he's at the Deathmatch Arena. Yeah. And they try to kind of justify it but they didn't really say anything so like he just needs it um you know out of out of all the cc heroes that we've had as established characters um actually there's probably one other person <clears throat> that i thought of actually two more i'm gonna i'm gonna go on a little bit of tangent yeah kano yeah. what the hell is kano doing um we've seen absolutely nothing from kano since arcane rising um and then I guess the next would be Ira. I would kind of consider Ira as more of an established character because she does have like a, a decent sized backstory already written for her, but we've got nothing. Um, LSS is keeping their mouths very uh, tightly shut and they're not <laughs> telling us if Ira's dead or alive. You know, my theory of her being centuries old, you know, they're not going to confirm it anytime soon, it no. seems. <laughs> um, I'd love them to do like an armory deck for Ira and like release like a a short story of like what she's actually doing if she's still around and we get like a cc legal version of her because i mean you can't play whirling miss blossom in any deck at the moment so it's you know, true it's i true. like that card it's pretty cool um so yeah they're, they're probably my answers i'd say reinar kano and uh ira uh let's Good figure question. out zen <laughs> The Zen problem before we get another ninja in CC, please. <laughs> um, I do want to say if anybody wants to go back to episode 127 when Kale was on for heavy hitters, there were a mm. lot of mysteries about the lore, as, as you just alluded to about Reinar. We came up with some pretty cool theories about what they can do with Reinar, you know, kind of becoming king of the Savage Lands and uniting the brutes and something like that. I mean, I, I thought that was the. It's a little tropey, but that seems awesome to me, you know? Yeah. I uh, I honestly think the next set we're going to get is Savage Lands. Oh, wow. So I think January, I think, is the next set. So I think it's going to be Savage Lands. That makes sense. And it's going to be like real, real tribal, jungly. Uh, we might get Necromancer. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe. Sweet. You know? I think, <laughs> uh, I mean, I think you could do a lot with the Savage Lands. I mean, it it's probably going to be a tall task. It be it might be a little tough to convince people to, you know, that we're getting more brutes, you know. But listen, listen. Now that now that there's a better aggro deck, nobody's really complaining about KO anymore. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. Smithle, who was on the show last week, asks, "Good app, good app." Out of all the lore you've discussed, what has been your favorite to date? That's tough. Uh, I did before the show go back through and look at all the lore i've narrowed it down to kind of three three my top three uh i'd probably say the third place would be the rosetta lore specifically the first two stories that they came out with with verdance and florian absolutely loved it the writing style was just like really fresh um just like really engaging was getting my you know imagination running wild as to like you know depicting the scene in my head as to how it's playing out and whatnot. Um, actually, little thing as well, I don't think I've really said it much, but due to popular demand, I will be doing narration videos of some of the lore. Uh, and the yep. first one will be the Rosetta lore. So I've already got a bunch of it recorded. I've just got to work on the voices a bit more and sound and whatnot. But um, yeah, so Rosetta lore, third place. Second place is actually Vincet's lore. Ooh. I absolutely loved Vincet's lore. <clears throat> I love this whole idea of, of her growing up in Solana and having this imaginary friend, um, Ren, I think is what she called it, um, and her mother sort of, 
I guess, betraying and, and snitching on her to the Magisters in Solana and Vincent suffering the, the price for having this quote-unquote imaginary friend um, and just the torture that they inflicted on her broke her and, and she kind of just snapped. And I just love the scene where she like blinds herself and, and she's talking about how she can finally see her friend you know, oh, Nazareth, yeah. um, you know, that was just so metal. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. Um, I'll probably have to put that on my list of, of lore to narrate in the oh, near yeah. future. Cause that, oh, such a cool story. And then first place, obviously, uh, to no one's surprise, it's got to be Viserai and Lord Sutcliffe's law. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've just been submerged in that law since the day it came out. I've spoiled so many cards about, you know, Viserai and, and Sutcliffe specifically. Just this, this really cool tale of <clears throat> this this man that was, um, you know, very insecure and and betrayed at the fact that the rest of his family, you know, inherited this either affinity, and he just couldn't wield magic, and it wasn't fair, you know, and they they treated him differently, and you know, he started looking into forbidden knowledge, and that caused a lot of issues, and he was persecuted for it, so he ran away, and then stumbled across this this poor soul that washed up on the shores and and you know tinkered with him um and experimented on him and then you know viscera reawakens not knowing who he is or what place he has in the world under control of this guy and it's just oh it's just such a juicy conflict and uh, just great storytelling you know even if some of it is a little bit cliche you know with the whole idea of like a, a master and his puppet but mm -hmm. you know i just there's so many things that, like, when I think about Viserai and, and Lord Sutcliffe, I'm just running, like, all these different scenarios through my head of, like, oh, what if this happened or what if that happened? And just, there's, it. they've built it up to a point where there's a lot of mystery that it keeps you guessing, but not so much that you're clueless as to what's happening. You, you have some reasonable ideas as to where it go, it, it can go, but, like, you're ready for a twist and yeah. I just can't wait to see what they do next. They've been hinting at stuff with his specializations in the expansion slots. So yeah, there's going to be, that's going to be my top one big viscerai reckoning here. I, yeah. I just feel it coming. I mean, like, you know, he's still a, a, a crowd favorite. Right. And actually speaking mm. of, speaking of viscerai, Darth Prentice asks, which CC legal room blade will be the most powerful post Rosetta release. I want to say Viscera. I think he's going to get a lot better. There's a lot of juicy cards for him. But honestly, I think just the way that fab metas tend to go with a new set, aggro decks are always like the easiest to solve. And oftentimes they're very powerful. I think Aurora is going to be the strongest just because <clears throat> like she can output quite a lot of damage and string together like, quite tricky turns that keep the advantage on her side if you order things correctly i mean burn and shock that card is not okay that's like five damage value for nothing like <laughs> yeah. who thought that was a good idea i mean obviously your attack has to hit but like that's not hard if you go wide like i i did actually play um kind of like a very jank game of like an open format CC on Talisha where you could use any cards, including mm -hmm. spoiled cards. And like a lot of the cards weren't actually functional. So I had to like manually lower my life total every time I, <laughs> you know, took damage. But I was playing Florian against Aurora and just, oh my God, just, it was so frustrating. They would play Burn Shock. I'm taking one and then it's like, okay, I now have to block every single attack fully or i'm taking four damage on top and she just outvalued me i couldn't get florian online and it was game over before i even knew it so yeah i just think aurora's going to be the easiest and she's going to be strong so we'll have to wait and see what her specialization is because that's still to come that's still to come i'm gonna say florian only because i want it to be <laughs> i mean i do too he's my choice obviously but you know i've as a rune blade player you get used to just accepting the fact that Maybe the hero you like isn't as good as you want it to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Believe me, I know. I know better than most. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, we both know. <laughs> um, and then Capolo, who, congratulations, just got married, 
Lore wise, yes, why isn't there ice in Rosetta if they haven't explained it? What is your theory why? Mm. Um I think like realistically, like real world, it's because they're not quite ready to bring back ice. They're waiting for the right time. As for why it's not in Rosetta in terms of like law, that's a lot harder. I think I think if they were to have included it, it might have muddied and diluted the waters a little bit for like the current story that they wanted to tell. Um, and plus, we know that ice is only really prevalent in two of the three regions that you know we of Aria that we we kind of see that being Vault Haven and Eisenloft. Um, so with a set literally called Rosetta, you know, the main focus of it has to be on Candlehold at that point. And we could have gotten some ice with, you know, Vault Haven, but it seems like they really wanted to focus on the lightning aspect. So they're, they're probably the reasons why. Um, I'm sure we will get ice soon, maybe next year, but... It'll actually be very interesting as to how they reintroduce it. Will we have another set next year that introduces ice? Or will we maybe have a two-region set where, you know, it could be uh, kind of a little bit like maybe a return to Volcor and we get, you know, Icelander returning plus Draconic. So, you know, they kind of balance it out that way so it's not just, you know, all ice for an entire set. You know, there's the balance. So. I could see that. I think we'll probably return to Volcor next year as well and, and probably get Ice and Draconic. So that's my thought. Yeah, and, and they've shown that they can tell <clears throat> these stories one element at a time, right? Like the, the mm. like we said, the Verdance and, and Florian storyline is, is, is pretty separate from the Aurora Ocilio storyline. So it didn't need to be in in this uh this set mm. and they can just wait it could be next set i think that might be a little too soon i hope that you're right on the savage lands but yeah <laughs> um, i think it would be a bit too soon yeah and then finally <laughs> we have a really serious question a uh, multiple serious mm. questions from junior who says do you think <laughs> do you think the remake of the crow and the release of florian was a coincidence don't you agree that aurora is so julia or suspicious that Verdant's looking like she's going to a Chapel Rowan concert. How do you think Ocilio fits into this brat summer? Mm. <laughs> very, very deep and and thought provoking questions. Um, Florian and Crow. I'm going to chalk it up to a coincidence. Yeah, probably. Um, Aurora being so Julia, I could see that she is a bit everywhere, but. <laughs> Hmm. I don't know if she's girl boss enough. Um, Verdance is Chappelle Rowan. <laughs> uh, and Acilio is clearly just trying his best to fit into Brat Summer, coming back from slumber uh, into a brand new aria. You know, perhaps when he went to, to sleep, it was, you know, uh, white boy summer, and now <laughs> it's Brat Summer. Um, so he has to kind of, you know alter his perception of the world a little bit and, and, and try his best to fit in. But he's doing his best, you know. He's, he's off on the side trying. Um, <laughs> you know, we can't put him down for that, so. <laughs> he's out here saying, I'm having a brat summer. Do you even know what that means? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this has been a great episode yet again. Thank you so much, mm. Gail, for coming on. We always appreciate you coming on to talk some lore. We got to sprinkle it in. It gets us excited for this set. I'm so stoked. Can't wait to play Florian. I'll play some Verdance too. And even a, I'll play them all. I'm crazy like that, guys. <laughs> um, can you please plug all of your things? And of course, thank you yet again. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm, I absolutely love coming on this. Uh, it's the highlight of every set for me. So I'm always stoked to, to be able to do it. I'm, I'm just a big fab nerd. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can find me pretty much everywhere. Dead Summer Art. Um, if you don't find me on a certain platform, it's because I'm not on it. Um, <laughs> just check out the YouTube. Um, I've been posting a lot more on my TikTok as well. Um, all my shorts go up on YouTube and TikTok. They're formatted to go on both. Um, obviously, you can find my my horrible takes on uh, Twitter or X. Um, today, I put up a post about Fruits of the Forest, yum yum. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> which I will be saying every time I discard that card. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Just uh, check out check out Fab Law. It's it's getting good again. So you know if you if you haven't been into the law so far, now's the time. It's it's, it's Brat Summer, baby. It's well, it's uh, it's Broadum now. Uh, well, here in the Bro, states, yeah. Uh, and then I guess Bring for you. <laughs> <laughs> bring, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, please check that out and play, check out the lore starter guide if you want to start getting into mm. lore and a more deeper level. You can continue to find me on Twitter slash X at Fresh Buds Pod. Check out the Buds Discord. It's a great place to hang out. YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, and then check out my other podcast I do with my cousin called Fresh Juice, where we talk about indie video games. It's a good time over there. And I'm excited, Kale, because you said to me. In a DM, I have food to talk about this time. What is I the do. food? <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> here it is. So, obviously, for many, many apps, I've had nothing to talk about with food because I'm very uh, regimented in what mm-hmm. I eat. But, in my town, uh, Australians will know of this fast food joint, which has now opened its doors for us, called Zambrero. And just from the name alone, you could probably guess it's Mexican. Zam? Um, Z? Zam. Yeah, with a Z. I'm just going to look it up real quick. Zambrero. So, um, I had never heard of them until they actually arrived in town. Uh, They set up shop at, like, one of the worst locations possible. It's right on the edge of a massive roundabout. So, when Zambrero was first opening and they had a grand opening day where they gave away a thousand free burritos... Of course, everyone wanted to go all at the same time, and it caused the massive traffic jam right at the big roundabout. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, my partner and I had wanted to try it since uh, it opened a couple months back, but we wanted to wait until the crowds died down, and, and it did. And um, you know, we walked in, and, and we weren't quite sure what we were going to order. Um, and my partner, she... Uh, she got a large burrito and boy was it large <laughs> uh it was it was it was so heavy um but it was pretty good um we kind of shared it and um they also had some like tortilla chips as well with like <clears throat> their specific kind of brand of seasoning which was awesome so i've always been a fan of mexican food it's got everything i love you know beef chicken tortillas you know a bit of Greens in there, peppers, um, you know, salsa, sour cream cheese. It's all good stuff. So, um, yeah, I don't know if there's anywhere in the U.S. that you like to particularly go for Mexican, maybe Taco Bell or Chipotle. <laughs> or... Well, so this, I mean, I'm looking at it now. It is <clears throat> it feels a lot like Chipotle here. Chipotle. Mm. We have Chipotle, Mo's, Pancheros, like this kind of fast casual, big burritos, burrito bowls, stuff like that. Taco Bell's like fast, fast food. Like you go through the drive-thru and you eat the, <laughs> the grossest taco you've ever seen in your life. But, you know, when you're inebriated, you're like, this is the best thing ever. Yeah, you don't care at that point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, funny enough, there is one Zambrero in the United States, in Kentucky, for any Kentucky fans wow. out there. Um, it does look really good. I mean, I, I've i been known to punish a burrito in my day, so it does look good. I'm very fortunate around me. We have a lot of uh, Mexican immigrants that like opened up just insanely good uh, Mexican joints. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. obviously we get a lot of that in the States because, well, we're right next door. So, but in a pinch, things like this do really tickle my fancy, but I'm happy that you guys have it down there. Yeah. They're, um, they're actually Australian. Like they originated here in Australia actually by, I think someone who was in like university Oh, wow. um, I think it's just like, I want to do this because um, one of the big things they also do is they do like a lot of charity stuff as well. So I think for every burrito you buy, they actually feed someone. That's awesome. So they've got like a, they got like a big counter. You walk into the, the, the store and uh, they have this big counter of how many meals they've served over their entire business's lifespan. So good cause too. Yeah. It's, so, it's good to feel good when you're eating yeah. some burritos. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds delicious. And unfortunately, 
I don't think we have time for Charmer, but we'll get to him eventually. Thank you all yep. so much. Super excited. If you see me in Tampa, say hi. Thank you all. Stay fresh. Buds. <laughs>